Hello and welcome to News Click. It is now 20 years since the demolition of the Babri Masjid in Ayodhya by Hindutva extremists. To discuss the continuing social, cultural and political impact of that traumatic event and the events that preceded and followed it, we have with us today Sukumar Murlidharan, veteran journalist. Welcome to News Click, Suku. Uh, the Babri Masjid demolition has left a permanent scar on the multicultural fabric uh, of our nation and on our secular polity. Has India become decisively or at least more sharply communalized than before? Yeah, well, when you say a permanent scar, I would not uh, use that word. It's, uh, it was a very deep scar, uh, no doubt about it. It was a very traumatic event. But these things can be healed, provided that you know, the nation state's uh, uh, institutional mechanism kicks in and does what is necessary and what is uh, warranted, what is mandated by the constitution to correct these uh, abuses. Unfortunately, that has not happened. So the scar has uh, remained and the scar, if anything, has got uh, deeper. And uh, corrective now will be a much more uh, tumultuous kind of event than uh, would have been the case earlier. And we should understand that Babri Masjid, when it occurred, was uh, a decisive blow against uh, pluralism, against um, uh, multiplicity of uh, perceptions of our history, of multiplicity of perceptions about our identity, which in a way reflected the, the true situation on the ground, because this is a very diverse country. And if we want to hang together as a country, we have to respect that diversity. But unfortunately, this was the precise opposite, saying that we want a single unitary point of view about how we look at our history. We want a single, single unitary pantheon of nationalist heroes, including uh, stretching as far back as mythology. And we will have corresponding to that uh, a clearly identified set of villains who we will identify as our enemies. So this obviously is not something that uh, uh, very large sections of this country can share in. And, uh, there was a coercive effort to impose this vision and the demolition at Ayodhya was a kind of the climactic act in that drama. So in the context of trying to heal these wounds, uh, what lessons do you think India has learnt or not learnt since the demolition? Well, in the immediate aftermath, uh, uh, you and I, we are old enough to remember uh, what a deeply traumatic moment it was. Uh, there was a sense of, of uh, national urgency that uh, this has gone too far and we have to deal with it in one way or the other. And um, political parties united, except for the authors of the demolition who remained isolated, the others united to kind of uh, present a broad-based kind of uh, consensus that uh, we should correct this wrong and we should ensure that it does not happen. Now, there were several tracks on which that uh, could have been pursued. Firstly, the demolition itself, they should have been accountably established for that. Who was responsible for it? And then, of course, the demolition was not an isolated event. It came after a long uh, cycle of mobilization uh, with uh, overt acts of violence against the religious minorities. And it was followed also by right. a long sequence of riots in which uh, Bombay, uh, as Mumbai was known then, was one of the worst affected cities. And that was, again, a Bomb a Bombay being a city then that so many of India, so much of India identified with. It was, uh, it was very symbolic that uh, the very heart of the nation is being uh, torn apart. So that moment should have been utilized and that, uh, you know, the processes of accountability to hold those responsible guilty under the process of the law without it appearing as political vendetta. No, because there was clear-cut uh, sure. legal provisions under which they could be charged. Sure. And also for the riots that preceded and followed. Unfortunately, none of this happened and uh, political deals were struck and opportunism prevailed and the principles of our constitution were entirely forgotten. Which is why 20 years after the event, we still right. can't say that we are immune to a further exactly. recurrence. And that is of precisely that. my question that 
since the demolition and its aftermath, the riots in Bombay, there have been many other such incidents coming leading up to today, uh, where the administrative actions required uh, have been seen to be lacking. And uh, what is otherwise normally presumed to be the last resort, which is the Indian judicial system, has also been unable to show itself capable of dealing impartially with such disputes and resolving them. And in fact, even the High Court judgment, which is the current operational judgment on the Ayodhya dispute, still has resorted to arguments relying on faith and belief rather than on an impartial judicial uh, accounting uh, of the system. Exactly. And what is most alarming about the high, uh, judgment of the Lucknow bench of the Allahabad High Court is that uh, it was a three-way. Uh, there were three uh, judgments, three separate judgments by a three-judge bench. You know, it's uh, sometimes very awkward to say these things, but uh, there was a clear ghettoization of the, of the mind, of the judicial approach there. Because the one judge who was from the minority community had a very different perception of the whole thing. He said that this whole, uh, this whole controversy is cooked up. He identified clearly that 1949 was an act of trespass, that the process by which the uh, mosque was uh, commandeered by local uh, communal forces and uh, the idols were inserted there was an act of trespass. And that, that original illegality created that entire political uh, turmoil that followed. And 1986 also he identified when the uh, the, uh, the uh, when the, when the doors, were, doors opened. were opened by order of a magistrate. That's right. I mean the matter is a title suit pending in uh, right. a higher judicial bench, and uh, there was clear political directive involved in the magistrate uh, ordering that the gates be opened for Hindu worshippers. So these were identified, but then he said that you know, but we can't push this case too much. And he, I think, quoted something from the theory of evolution about uh, the fittest surviving and uh, so on and so forth and said, you know, let's back off and just allow this uh, majoritarian point of view to prevail. But that was not a judicial uh, accounting so, in a sense. So that judgment was entirely void of judicial logic. That's right. Uh, on either side. Uh, <laughs> on any side, in fact. <laughs> in fact, the minority judge had more, more of yeah. the judicial uh, prudence uh, within Quite. his uh, judgment. The Quite. other two didn't have very yeah. much of it. So, so this is what is alarming about it. Because under the pressure of circumstances, with the coercive kind of political environment that prevails, even the judiciary, which is an institution that we all have learned to respect and which has in several <coughs> of its determinations shown itself to be worthy of that uh, respect. In this case, it just couldn't do what is right. So uh, fortunately, the Supreme Court has set aside the judgment, uh, used a very strong word, said, it that, said that it's a perverse judgment. But then <laughs> how far the Supreme, yeah, Supreme Court exactly. is actually going to correct the situation is still. We don't know. Yeah. In fact, uh, don't you feel a sense of deja vu in watching what is happening in Hyderabad as we speak with the dispute over uh, a recent, a fairly recent Hindu temple come up in the precincts around the Charminar and you've got the same old arguments being raked up as to how ancient this Hindu temple was and whether it has come up now or then. And still, there is no firm administrative uh, action and one is still waiting to see whether any judicial action will be taken to resolve this dispute and in what way it will happen. Yes, precisely. I mean, that's the most alarming uh, development because the Chaminar is, as far as I can uh, uh, understand, a protected monument and uh, should have, uh, uh, there should be very str uh, strict rules about uh, any kind of construction activity in its uh, near vicinity. And to see that this has come up without anybody noticing it, and uh, the Hindu has done a great public service by highlighting this uh, this uh, issue at this stage. Uh, we have to also look back at uh, 1949 and Ayodhya being one among many such uh, acts of uh, acts of uh, territorial conquest, so to speak, because it was a very fraught environment. Right. And partition had just happened. <clears throat> there was <clears throat> large-scale violence. Uh, both sides were inflicting horrific violence on the other. 
and there was a deep sense of ill ill feeling towards the other so ayodhya there had been a dispute uh, brewing for a long time but that was purely local now by that intrusion of the idols there that local dispute became in a sense identified with the identity of the nation sure. coming to being so you know in some senses uh, suppressing that other identity became a uh, way of asserting the new identity of the indian nation now this has continued and if you consider the correspondence at that time between say uh, prime minister jawaharlal nehru and the home minister sardar vallabhbhai patel uh, mr nehru does point out that even in the vicinity of delhi there have been several such cases of mosques being kind of you know uh, converted through ritual introduction of uh, hindu uh, icons and hindu symbols and that this is a most uh, uh, unsatisfactory situation it has to be reversed he makes that very clear statement so this is in a sense continuing still even after 60 years what well, the lesson of this is that this uh, this assertion of uh, national identity by opposition and by antagonism towards another is still continuing and uh, you know with v- potentially very very uh, dangerous consequences let me ask you a slightly wider ranging uh, question uh, in matters relating to so called uh, religious or community sensitivities in india there is clearly an increasing resort to pressure tactics Uh, sometimes violence uh, in order to push a particular communitarian uh, vision or perspective on issues uh, to push a de facto even if not a legal uh, argument uh, whether it is monuments biographies novels paintings what have you there is an insistence on pushing one communitarian vision even at the cost of public order through violence uh, etc given this increasing trend and given weaknesses of the administrative as well as judicial system in tackling uh, this how does the modern secular indian state and indian society evolve to deal with these challenges well <laughs> this is obviously a very very difficult question to address and uh, uh, we are uh, touching at the very heart of how we identify smaller identities and how these are allowed to uh, allowed their own uh, domains in which they have primacy but in some senses are willingly subject to the to the larger identity of the nation which is a compound of multiple multiple such identities arrived at through a uh, process of consensus rather than coercion now there could be coercion which induces one uh, small community to give up its uh, its language its observances its ritual practices and submerge it in the larger for instance what what's called sanskritization process right. of the lower caste sure in some senses it was voluntary in some senses it was driven by uh, aspiration in some senses it was uh, coerced well, partly coercive yeah. as well yeah so, sure so uh, uh, at uh, some uh, at some point in india's history i think a lot of these smaller identities got the feeling that uh, they were getting a unfair deal uh, you know uh, if you look at the cultural production of say 30 or 40 years back you had uh, you had uh, cultural productions like the muslim social you know, which sure. was which was a very important genre in our film that's uh, right uh, about the muslim community and their own internal debates and how they're dealing with challenges of modernization and reckoning with uh, the uh, with how to preserve the best of that tradition without you know being bound by all that is uh, regressive in it you won't find that kind of cultural productions anymore now they're more and more uh, focused on what they view as the fundamentals and that applies for variety of communities now the nadar community in tamil nadu is on the war path because of some um, paragraph in uh, history textbook which says that they were yeah. migrants in the late uh, 16th century right. to <laughs> southern right. what is now southern kerala now the point is that the current identities linguistic identities are being read back into history 
whereas these are all modern creations and you know artifacts very much of modernization and there's no need to uh, to make uh, your current claims your current entitlements to uh, whatever is the national product and whatever is the is the uh, are the rights guaranteed by the states make it subject to some kind of sure. primeval or primordial identity we are all equal citizens now that is the reality that uh, somehow we are not able to get everybody to accept so, because the state is unable to yeah. uh, live up to exactly. that uh, guarantee of and equality before and the, the law and in the middle of all this the lack of equality before the law demands an equal recognition of evidence of history of fact based uh, solutions and that seems to be regressing in the face of communitarian pressures emotional exactly. pressures and ideological pushes of one kind uh, even if you accept that the reading of history that the reading of facts that the reading of evidence can be different sure. uh, depending on your point of view sure. you have to accept that we should uh, have uh, uh, a discourse based on equality at this time and that uh, the, the doors are open for everybody to come and place their viewpoint without uh, re resorting to this kind of political coercion or threat of violence now unfortunately that environment is not yet established now that essentially is a failure of the of the indian state in in the sense of uh, uh, its inability to live up to constitutional uh, uh, premises constitutional uh, guarantees so it's very easier said than done but sure. i think uh, a lot of it is uh, also uh, a function of uh, rising inequality the uh, failure of uh, the media for instance to fairly represent diverse viewpoints um, and now you have uh, increasing uh, dependence on the what's called the market philosophy which has principles of exclusion so possibly we're moving in the reverse direction no? uh, rather than uh, allowing Uh, more and more voices to come into the national debate what we found over the last 20 years despite all the appearances of growing diversity of uh, the media and so on is that uh, the discourse is becoming more and more exclusive thank you uh, sukumar i think we've raised a lot more issues than we uh, perhaps intended to when we started this discussion i hope we'll have a chance to come back to some of these issues again fairly soon thank you once again